Hello, my name is Chrissy Rodriguez, and on January 23rd, 2015, I participated in a, a PLT meeting on my campus, uh, CC Wynn High School in Eagle Pass, Texas, and during that meeting, I did my participating video um, over the 45 minutes that we had our meeting and the following is what happened during the meeting. Your presence, I mean your attendance is always appreciated and of course your participated a participation um, is always also appreciated as well. Your input in a positive way has always uh, impacted the program in a very positive way so I thank you for that as well. I went ahead and created an agenda of some of the items that um, Ms. Castillon wanted us to discuss, but also items that we have discussed in our PLTs in the past. So one of the items we talked about in our last meeting was the update of our TEKS. Um, at first, we thought that they were going to be implemented next year, and Ms. Castillon received an email stating that they will not be implemented until 2017, 2018. So all these changes that are going to occur, titles and credits, um, course titles and the credits, we don't have to worry about it right now because those changes will not occur until 2017. We'll probably start getting ready for them um, slowly and then the year before they become effective and then we'll really have to work on scope and sequence and year at glance. Okay, textbook request and price codes needed. I went ahead and left it there even though many of you have already complied with this request, but if there's anybody needing teaching resources, even if they don't get approved for this school year, we at least have your needs assessment now, and that way at the beginning of next year we can certainly uh, purchase you what you need. For BIM 1, we are going in, in a transitional phase right through a transitional phase right now. We're um, moving forward with 2000, Microsoft Office 2013, so as labs become um, updated and we purchase new labs, we will also purchase new textbooks, and I believe you got a new lab, so you will be getting Microsoft Office 2013 textbooks, and then as teachers get their um, computer labs renewed, then they will also get new textbooks as well. The only thing is that, uh, just to throw it out there, be very careful with your books. Take good care of them, especially the BIM 1 books. They went up from $120 to $205 a piece. And at this time, we're trying to negotiate with Sengage so that they can give us uh, a better That's deal true. since we do have to, at some point, replace 12 classroom sets of 30. So we looked at the cost, and it would be something like $75,000 for textbooks alone. There's no way we can do it in one year. It may take two, maybe three. So at some point, there's going to be teachers who won't get new textbooks until next year at the end of the year. I don't know. So hopefully, we'll be able to get a good deal on those books so that everybody can Is have their needs met. Those books are very expensive as well. Also, um, when you teach a class with um, a group of teachers, it's always best that you collaborate with your group of teachers so that you all make a consensus agreement on which book works for you. Otherwise, then we'll have teachers who may not be very happy with a book that we have in place. Um, uh, Ms. Castillon has always said, you know, always allow the student, the teachers to make the recommendation on the textbook or the equipment that they need because if you order it, Ms. Menchaca, and it's the wrong one, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So just keep that in mind. Always make sure that the teacher makes the recommendation. And that's why we ask for price codes, not because we want to give you more work, yeah. but we, we want to make sure that you guys are getting what you need. Great speed accounts. Um, we're just starting the second semester. You're getting a new set of students. Some of your classrooms don't have labs. 
I've already run into problems with oh, it. Oh, you are? Oh, okay. Some of the students are is coming out saying it's inval invalid username or password. Unless they forgot it? No, and mm -hmm. I, I've even gone in and plugged in the ID number and the birth dates, and uh -huh, it still sounds... gives it me the same error message. So I've called Techno or I've emailed technology, and, and, no. and when they try to reset it, I still get the same results. So I don't know what's going okay. on or who we need to talk to. I, Ms. Castillones they had talked to Mr. Salinas. Mr. Alfredo Salinas is the one in charge of um, uh, the Great Speed program, basically. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to go through him so that we can uh, get this uh, technicality taken care of. Great Speed. Hold on. Reset. If the students also forgot their username and password, then that's that's another concern. We do need to address that. I don't know the, the contact person yet, but I'll find out and email you. Now, if you don't have a computer lab, then it's very difficult for you to give the opportunity to the student to create an account. But what you can say is, if you have a computer lab class, then ask your teacher to give you time to create your GradeSpeed account. Basically, the goal with this is we want every single student in, Eagle, in CC Win to have a GradeSpeed account. Why? They monitor their progress. They want monitor their grades. If they're failing, it's very easy for either parents to see that they're failing. And another thing, they're not constantly asking you in class, can you print out a progress report? Can you give me a, uh, my progress report from another class or whatever? All they have to do is log into their GradeSpeed account and take a look for themselves. They're all set up already? Like, well, mm -hmm. that was supposed to happen last semester. But maybe when the student set up the account during their second period in BIM, he, that student was absent and never got to create the account. That's what I'm saying. Just make a general statement. Great speed accounts for students are available. If you haven't created an account, go ahead and take uh, five minutes if you have a lab. If you don't have a lab, then tell them to go to a, a computer teacher so that they can create an account. Okay? Um, grading policy. Since we're starting the beginning of the semester, you should have given your students a course syllabus. Part of what you have to put in the uh, course syllabus is grading policy. Make sure you do share with the students that they are allowed because it's district policy. If they fail an exam, whether it's a hands-on, whether it's a presentation, or even safety, more so safety, um, you need to give them the opportunity to make up that test. Okay? I know that in, in you all's uh, shops, they have to pass 100% of the exam. Is that correct? In order for them to be able to use tools and, and be involved in the lab. Okay, so for the rest of you, in any other uh, assignment that or test that the students may take, you can allow and you should allow the students to make up the failing test grade for a maximum of a, of a 70. 70. Just one time? Yes. Once you, and now, just because you offer the opportunity, if the student doesn't come to you the day that you agree to test them, then you've already offered the opportunity, okay? So just let them know. On such and such day, I will be giving retest. If you failed it, you're welcome to come and retest because the opportunity has already, already been given for a maximum of a 70. They can't come back and say, oh, well, I got it all right, it's 100. No, because it's a makeup test. Does Seven. it have to be like in it the does, morning, during class, after school? It's teacher discretion. teacher discretion. It's up to you. You, you If you want to do it in the morning, How's if you want to do it for the assignments, though? Is it going to be the same? For the what? The assignments. The, no, no, this is for gr uh, exams. Exams, yeah, major grades. For assignments, we can use even up to 100 or? It's up to you. So to us, okay. No, okay. The thing is, if you do that, then nobody's going to do their work. They're going to fail, and then whenever I feel like doing it, I'm still going to get a 100, or I still have a chance to get a 90. So be careful with that. There has to be a consequence for not complying. There has to be a consequence for not studying. So if you say, no, well, you guys have the opportunity to retest for a full grade, then nobody's going to take your test seriously the first time. 
They're going to wait. They're going to fail. They're going to look at the test. They know what's in the test. When we retest, we already know what's in the test. You can always change it, though. So I would suggest that you just go with a 70 uh, maximum grade policy. Stick to that. And that way you make it fair for all students. Okay? Now, um, another thing regarding grading policy. Those of you with a CTSO, if you have a student organization, and let's say that you take your kids to competition, and many of you are starting to travel already, HOSA, FBLA, BPA, all these other FFA, all these other um, CTSOs. Great, it's great that you have kids that participate because not all of them step up to the plate to be part of it. But you can never use the results of a competition as part of their grade. You can never. So let's say the student does not advance and they do poorly in a competition. You can come back and in grade speed, post a grade for that competition event and have that grade be a 70. And when they question it, they say, oh, the teacher says, oh, you didn't advance. You didn't do good in the competition. That's why you have a 70. You can't do that. You're penalizing the student because it can always come back to the teacher and say, parent can say, well, maybe the reason why my child didn't advance is because the teacher was never available to, to prepare my student for my child for competition. So you need to be very careful with it. Never use competition results as part of their grade. Okay? Always have proof of your assignments. I know sometimes when um, in, in the trade, I'm trying to think, well, how can you prove a grade on an assignment, your projects? If you, uh -huh. I keep a folder on every single one of my students. I put their work in there. Mm -hmm. And for like video game design, they're all project-based. I have a folder where they save all of their projects on a in flash the, drive. Okay, in the computer. Mm -hmm. On a flash drive or external. Uh -huh. And that's how they're It's graded. an electronic version yeah. of it, basically. Yeah, that's yep. a good way of keeping so it. So each student has a folder, and then that way if I have a parent conference, mm -hmm. it's there for folder. the parents to look at too. And keep in mind that your grade speed assignments, you know how you create the assignments in grade speed? They have to reflect the actual assignment that you give the student. So if you have something similar to what Christy has in place, and I know that for the trade courses, that kind of sometimes doesn't work because you don't actually have a a tangible document uh, but have something to prove it that states okay this is the assignment this is the grade so if the parent ever questions you you can always say let me print out an assignment list from grade speed and let me pull out the folder of assignments and they should balance out the grade on the actual assignment with what you have posted and that's actually something good to have in place so that if you make a mistake even typing in the grade, you can always go back to your folder. Or if a student claims that I did it, you know that happens all the time. I turned it in now. I, I did give it to you. You misplaced it. Okay, well, let's, let's look for it. Or you can always say, oh, show it to me in the computer. You may be right. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Yes, I might have lost it, but show it to me in your account. They don't have it. They've lost it. So that's why that also keeps everybody in check. It protects you. And it also keeps the student on check with their grades. But for the trades, do y'all have iPads? Y'all don't have iPads? Yeah. Well, what they could do is take pictures. Take pictures. pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And make a portfolio of yeah. pictures. That's a very good idea. No? No, I, I don't want to use it. <laughs> <laughs> what about a camera? A regular 35 minute camera? Camera? I have my camera. When? But for projects, but I don't do that. You don't, you don't do that. I, I, I put them, I do assignments, but right now I started to, to ask my students uh, that I'm going to take a binder or folder with all the assignments as a test grade. So it's their responsibility to have it. That's At the end of the nine weeks. At the end of the nine weeks. So yeah, they... because everybody throw it away and everything. So exactly. not anymore. Okay. Very good system. I had something similar to Christy, but I would keep the folder in the classroom knowing that mm -hmm. if I would give them back the assignments, yeah. even if I would provide the manila folder, mm -hmm. they were going to misplace it. So just as a safeguard, I bought some those portable cubbies and I just mm -hmm. put the folder in there. So every time I would return an assignment, you put it in your folder. You can't get rid of it until the end of the nine weeks when we've already compared grade speed with a folder. 
So that, you hold their folders too, also? Yeah, yeah, yeah file them. Yeah. See, I'm right there in a box. Put first period folders. No, I have a folder with each student's name uh -huh. on it that I file their individual papers in, along with like the course syllabus where they sign mm -hmm. and the technology contract that they sign. Everything's in there mm -hmm. for yeah, each individual yeah. student. Yeah, because the students will always say. Kind of senior threw away a folder. I go, she wants to prove me. And she did six assignments. Mm -hmm. I said she did it. Where are they? Bring me your folder, please. And uh huh. She goes, I threw it away. No, mm -hmm. you don't throw it away. You and keep I it. That's keep why it. I usually keep it in the yeah. classroom. I keep it until the end of June, and then I throw everything away. It works pretty good if you have a lab, if you give a, a daily assignment, paper daily assignment, it becomes a little bit more complicated for the trait because they do a lot of hands-on projects, they do skills, they do safety. I mean, they do so much. So maybe just coming up with, with a template or something of all the skills that you teach, list them, and then on the side put a grade and have that paper with you so that when the student questions why they didn't pass or why they have that missing assignment, then they might have not been present when you taught a certain skill and that's why they didn't earn a grade. And I can help you design the spreadsheet. Okay, that's not a problem. I just need to know what's going to go in it. And we, we can certainly help you get a little organized in that. Um, I also want to congratulate all the PLTs uh, because members because we did get our after school tutorial approved and the idea was born here in these meetings that we have. And so I want to let you all know that uh, many positive things um, have transpired since the establishment of them. I know that we take a little bit of time away from what you do during your conference period, your planning and so forth. But CTE is so diverse, it's so huge. We have 50 clusters, we have 76 courses. If we don't keep updated with what everything that's going on within each cluster, then we don't know CTE, we only know what we teach. But when we collaborate and we bring all these clusters together, then we can pretty much uh, talk to anybody about all of our programs. So thank you so much for your collaboration. Ms. Uh, Angie Donnelly is the teacher who will be teaching BIM 1 after school three days out of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Unfortunately, we only had Angie apply and there was two positions. So hopefully next year more business teachers will apply if the program gets approved. And I can tell you that the only way it's going to continue to become successful is by us keeping this program alive. If we have students attending the after school program, we're going to have it next year. But if there's no enrollment, then that money is going to get placed somewhere else, if the money is even there. So we want to make sure that we become successful with the after school tutorial. Now, at some point, Ms. Castillon and I had discussed that we would allow students from any CTE class attend the tutorial because that way if you have a student who's been out for X amount of days and they've fallen behind, instead of you trying to catch up the student up to par, then they would only go to the after school program with a portfolio created by the teacher of record, complete the work, take it back to the teacher of record, have it graded, post your grades, done deal. Unfortunately, the way the position got approved was through BIM 1 only. So we cannot allow any other student other than BIM 1 students attend. The way that you all can contribute to the success of the tutorial program is by promoting it. So tomorrow morning, you, I mean Monday morning, you can tell your students, BIM 1 tutorial has been approved. It starts Tuesday. If you fail BIM 1, which is a course for graduation, then I encourage you to talk to your counselor so that you can be referred to the after school tutorial. And that's how you guys can contribute. So this program is specifically for BIM 1. And I already have a list for Eagle Pass High School students. I'm waiting for CC Wins BIM 1 failures. So hopefully we'll have a good number. Also mention to your students, if you're currently taking BIM 1, and let's say you're already failing because you've been out three days and you haven't submitted any work, then you can attend the after-school tutorial program and recover all those missing assignments. 
the tutorial teacher will then submit the work to you if you're a BIM teacher. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip PSYOP strategy because we're going to do a mini lesson in a little bit. And, and so I'm going to cover all the items on the agenda first and then we'll come back to it. Um, for those of you that have um, a CTE certification program incorporated into your discipline, very important, I created this um, document which will help you keep track of the competencies that you teach in order to make sure that the, the students are prepared to test. And I'll explain to you why it's important to have a time, timeline and a criteria for testing. Anybody who's involved with certification testing knows that it's not an easy task. You have to cover your teaching objectives and you also have to cover your testing objectives for the certification that your students are going to earn. So you're having to plan for both and just merge them all together at once. What criteria do you all have in place in order to determine which students get certified? I'll pick on you, Mr. Navarro. You take some kids to, to do welding certification, mm -hmm. right? You just don't randomly select a student. You're going to select those students that in your fair judgment are prepared to pass that test. To take the test. First of all, if I see that student qualifies to take the test, he take the test. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't decide if they pass or not. Exactly. I need to follow the code. The code if they if they meet the requirements to be certified, now they are certified. And we perform the, the, the breaking test because we need to check the welds, bending them, breaking them. And if that test that the student performed meet that Minimum requirements of passing the test, he get uh, he okay. get that certification. Good no job. matter no matter if, he, if I like it or not. Exactly. If it met the requirements from the code, yes or exactly. no. Exactly. So that's what I do. Very good, and that's exactly what I expected to hear. Okay, allowing a student to take a certification test and having the student pass in the class are two different things. The student can be passing your class. Great. That doesn't mean that because a student is passing the class means that that student will be allowed to test. There is an investment involved that the school district pays. Every single certification exam has its own price tag. Some of them are $30. Some of them are $250. It just depends what type of certification it is. The district now has a policy where if the student passes the test, they get a reimbursement. If they don't pass the test, then they lose out on their money. And that was brought about because there were certain areas where students were not being successful and we were actually losing quite a bit. Now, keep in mind that for certain certifications, not only does the district pay for the test, but they pay for the enrollment of the students being part of the certification program. For example, the CNA students, they're taught here at C.C. Wayne, but we have a contract with Southwest Texas Junior College. Southwest Texas Junior College charges the district an X amount of dollars per student. Right off the bat. So if the student doesn't pass the test, the district has already invested money on this student. And it's in the thousands. It's not a couple of hundreds. It's in the thousands. So we want to make sure that throughout the year, teachers are teaching students the competencies or the objectives that are going to prepare the student to pass that test. And I went ahead and created this spreadsheet for you. You don't have to use it if you don't want to, or you can tweak it as you please. I'll email it to you. And the reason why I would feel it's important is so that this tool will help you determine who's going to test at the end of the school year or whenever they test. Okay? Now, let me give you an example of how this tool can help you. This spreadsheet keeps track of the students that are, that are enrolling your class and are going through a certification 
process. It tells you what week you're on. What are you teaching that week? Week one, week two, you can put dates. It also allows you to put the competency. What are you teaching your kids this week that are gonna prepare them for the test? So you type it in, the competency that you're, or your objective. The grade. Let's say the students get a 70. Well, maybe a 70 is not good enough to qualify them. It's like you said, you have to test to see if it tests the bending test. And if it doesn't pass, then that's, it's no good. Is that correct? Yeah, no good. Okay, so it's the same thing. Then you need a grade your competency based on whatever criteria you have in place. You want to make sure that your standards are set high so that the student is better prepared to score a decent grade and a passing grade in their certification exam. And then I went ahead and added two more columns. Met expectations, did not meet expectations. So even though they might have gotten a 70, that doesn't mean they're ready to test. So you keep track of your students how they're progressing. If at the end of the school year, let's say uh, early May, you need to make a determination who's going to test. If you have a student who consistently got 70s and 75s, that may, be not, that may be a student who may not be eligible to test because even though they are passing the class, they're at risk of not passing their certification exam. At that time, you will have the difficult task to decide who tests and who doesn't. Can't be open to everybody because there's an investment involved. So if you decide that the student will not test, I can foresee a problem. You're gonna have very upset parents stating or coming to you, the principal, the superintendent, the director, and everybody else why is it that Mr. Navarro did not allow my child to test? And when you have concrete evidence of why you decided that, then nobody can tell you otherwise because it wasn't about you deciding. It was the student, right? Comes back to I had no idea we, had, we could decide. I mean, not my program. Uh -huh. Everybody has to test, but the other programs, there are some that... They can decide which ones? I mm -hmm. do that. Yes. Yes, I have my students at the beginning of the year. I have them sign a contract along with their parents. I go over everything that I expect and what I want to see. If they don't fulfill that and if they don't pass the certification, and I tell them up front, I choose who goes to take the test. If I don't see them doing everything on my list and I don't think they're going to pass the test, they don't go test. If they do go test and they fail the test, they have to pay the school the two hundred dollars yes. for the test. Mm -hmm. yes. If they pass it, the school reimburses. Re yeah, reimburses they, the they, money. They get it for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get it for free. So I've I've met with the parents. I keep my list. I have a binder full of all this documentation that I keep along with the practice test I give them. They have to go purchase a book. I give them a study guide with 700 questions on it. You know, I've got all this that's similar Your to this. Your documentation is going to protect yeah. So everything. I choose who goes to test, not Now, let students. me tell you where parents can rebuttal your decision. You have got to have your paperwork in check. Because if you have proof that the child got a 70, then they can always come back and say... Maybe the teacher failed, and that's, that's just by nature as parents, that's how we react. We're going to put the blame on somebody else instead of our child, so, but we need to be ready for that. So how did the student or how did the teacher prepare the student for this competency? If you keep record of what you're teaching based on the competencies of the test, we can intervene early in the year. Let's say that the first two competencies were pretty easy com and they did well, but competency three became a little bit more complicated and they got a 70. Competency four, the same thing. So you know that kid is struggling. Have record of it and make sure you make that parent contact. Your child is at risk. On May 29, they're going to go test. 
and I have the difficult task to determine who's going to go, Mr. So-and-so, and your child has been failing or your child has been barely making it. So that's how you protect mm -hmm. everybody, okay? Because remember, I mean, they're going to get a little defensive if you don't take their child to competition or to um, testing. But remember, keep in mind, there's an investment involved. And then, if students don't do good, it reflects on who? On the teacher. It comes back to you and they're going to say, you don't have a very good passing rate. You, you took a lot of students that were not prepared for it. So you want to improve your passing rate. You start with good documentation. And you make sure that you can prove that you are teaching to the competency. It's like teaching to the test. When we had tax, I mean, we got to the point where teachers were teaching to the test. When it comes to a certification exam, it's the same thing. You're going to teach to the test if you want to maximize your passing rate. But you've got to have proof because that's when, especially if it's going to be costing the parents. Here my child has spent a whole year, and now this child didn't pass. And that's when doubts and questions come in. But if you have something in writing and you have record of everything, one of the things that I used to hear when I was in the classroom, nobody told me. Nobody called me. So, but when you have, yes, ma'am, I did. You even signed. Here, we can even add another column of initials. You were informed that your child was at risk of not testing because of whatever, okay, whatever reason. So if you want to use this instrument, great. If you don't want to use it and you have something else in, in place, do use whatever works for you. I just wanted to facilitate you with a tool that's going to prepare you uh, to track those students who may be at risk of not passing your certification exams. All right, I can okay. bring what I have next meeting to show my yeah. okay. binder that I keep. Yeah, we can, yeah. We I can, can bring it next meeting and, and share, share it. it. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Um, now, in regards to special pops portfolios, we've talked about this in the past. We really need to put something in place. Um, just put a general portfolio of assignments for those students that may experience throughout the year and extenuating circumstance. It doesn't have to be a special ed student. It can be a student who may be put in homebound due to an accident or an illness. What are you going to do as a teacher, because we can't get them out of our classroom, to make sure that that student is getting the same quality education as those students in the classroom? You have to have something in place, a folder that you can easily, oh, so and so went at homebound, here it is. You can modify what's in it. Let's say that in your regular classroom, you've given 15 assignments and the student is gonna be out a whole month. You can modify that. You're, you can accommodate that student with maybe 10 assignments and you can double up a couple of them to equal 15 grades. You can do that, okay? It's up to you. But the, the objective here is have something already in place instead of scrambling when the homebound teacher walks in and asks for assignments. Because I can guarantee you that homebound teacher is already documenting on such and such date, 2.30 in the afternoon, I requested from Mr. Navarro, X, Y, and C, never replied. Never replied. Yeah, I saw. They covered themselves. You will always remain the teacher of record all the time. Even if the student is in homebound, if you notice on your grade speed, that student will apply will appear in your attendance report. So just to give you a heads up, start working on, on putting it together. Padas, have you guys gotten evaluated already? Yes. All of you? Todos? No? Okay. Mr. Uh, yeah. yeah. He didn't show up. He didn't show up. Okay. Yeah, I had three <laughs> teachers that told me that today. That he didn't show up. You got evaluated? Yeah, but after four. Uh, <laughs> yeah, five tests. Tests are trying. <laughs> yeah, that was my. Uh, so, her. did they go the day that you had actually scheduled it, or no. he just appeared at any. The last uh, time he appeared. Okay. Suddenly. <clears throat> Suddenly. Might not okay. the second day. Were you uh, just but unannounced, walked in, or, or was no, it I planned? Okay. What about you, Mr. Gilmer? 
No, with Mr. Mendoza, right? I don't know who your yes. evaluator is. Yes. Mr. Mendoza? Yes. He came in, he evaluated, yeah. He um, already evaluated me. Uh, last week of December or something like that. Okay. Maybe. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you've been evaluated. Yes. And that's your formative evaluation, right? Yes. Okay. No more evaluations. Okay. No. So, I guess I'm a little late with this topic, but I'm, I'm still going to at some point go in depth. My ultimate goal is for you guys to earn a score that you deserve. I have seen many, many teachers that are putting a lot of time before school, after school, during class time. And, and just because they score proficient, proficient is good enough. If the best score you can earn is exceed expectations and you, you deserve it, you, ex, you should earn that, exceed expectations. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to break down the evaluation domains and kind of target one domain at a time and take a look at what you are doing in each of the domains that you know you have earned exceeds. It's very difficult to make judgment in 30 minutes. Very hard to make judgment. But if you were to keep a binder or a folder or I don't care how you keep it, of all the things that transpire in your classroom from behavior to um, you know, learning objectives, sci-up strategies, communication with other uh, colleagues, just you constantly keep record of everything that you do throughout the day and you share it with your evaluator a day or two before your evaluation, then he has a better glimpse, a better idea of who you are as an educator. Because he cannot make a fair judgment in 30 minutes. You may have a bad day that day. You may have a group of kids who are just not having a good day. And if you have a hard time controlling that kid or it just doesn't turn out your way, I would hate for you to be penalized for that one precise experience. Rather than, okay, what about all the good things I've done throughout the year that they didn't see? So... Uh, even though some of you have been evaluated and what's done is done, if you have any documentation that they have never seen and you are not in agreement with your PADAS score, it's okay to tell or to share with your evaluator, you know, I failed to share this with you, I forgot to show you, but you know what, in this domain under student behavior, I do have record that I contact a parent and and I do all these interventions. I just didn't have the time to share it with you, so I wanted to just let you see it. They may be able to change it to exceeds. Just because certain responsibilities as an educator or procedure means that everybody's doing that. And if you are one of the few that does have procedures in place and you have proof of them, you want to earn your exceeds. You do want to earn them. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to continue picking on Mr. Navarro. I went to his lab the other day, his welding lab, and my God, he's organized. Very, very clean, neat, or, organized. And it's a welding shop. It's supposed to be dirty and it's justifiable if there's dirt and and welding machines all over the place, you can justify it. We just finished working on a project. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and his lab was pretty neat, and everything is labeled, tools, and I, I was pretty impressed. And so I hope that when his evaluator makes judgment in that area, in safety or whatever, they see that. And unfortunately, in order for him to earn exceeds, there's got to be a comparison. Because just because it's procedure to keep it clean and organized doesn't mean that everybody's doing it. So in order for him to earn that exceeds, there's got to be some comparison. And, and they can definitely do that comparison. I mean, he takes care of not only making sure the students are learning, but also making sure that students are in a safe environment. So... Congratulations. It was really, really clean and neat and organic, very impressive. And he's got procedures in place. 
I asked him how he kept the, the lab so clean and af after every, before the bell rings, uh, he makes sure that students pick up after themselves every single day for 187 days out of the year. <laughs> There's not one day that the students just pick up and leave and drop everything. No, he makes enough time in that 80 minute instructional time to make sure that students take the time to pick up after themselves. That's awesome. And they do it on their own. He does, I mean, I'm sure at the beginning he has to constantly remind them, but then it becomes a habit and a procedure, and everybody just does it naturally. That's really good, okay? I need to get some of those skills so that I can apply them at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. Now, in regards to the PSYOP strategy real quick, it's going to be five minutes, I promise you. Get one of these. Uh, here you go. This is a strategy you can use in your in your classroom as an icebreaker. I know that the, the nine weeks just started. I'm even going to do one, okay? Uh, did everybody get one of these little papers? One of these. Right here. Mr. Ray, Are we talking about you our gotta, own? Yes, own yes. Yeah. Okay. So did everybody get a list of traits, character traits? We're going to talk about our own faults. Uh, yeah, well, hopefully qualities. Quality. And we don't have a lot of faults. <laughs> I don't have a copy of the... Uh, which, this? Yes. Were there any extra, extra of copies of the character traits? I've got several right Okay, <laughs> get one and... I got all of them. Oh, they were supposed to be. <laughs> Here. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, from the list of character traits, select a trait that you would like. Okay, first of all, select three traits that apply to you. In the back, in the back of, of right here, in the back of this paper. In the back. Look at the list of character traits and write three traits that identify who you are. Three? In the back. In the back, uh huh. Three. It doesn't matter what. They can be positive, negative, as long as you're totally honest. <laughs> <laughs> and then ask I see a lot of teachers that I know here also <laughs> Also, put your name on the upper right-hand side because we need to know who you are. Uh-oh. Is Castillo going to see you? No, no, no. This is just for us. <coughs> okay, then you want to pass it around and have... Put your name so we know who you are. Um... <laughs> then every single one of us will get to write one character trait that we see in you. So, some of the guys, like, I don't really know. You don't really know. Okay, well, just based on, on what you've seen them here. He's quiet. He may be shy. Okay? And so we need to get to know each other. That's why we, we need to...